So here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, when we had the COVID-19 lockdown, everybody lost their shit over making sourdough bread. Whereas what we did is we thought, well, if you don't have wheat and you don't have yeast, what would the great cuisines of the world do? And if you're looking at great cuisines of the world, of course, you need to go no further than India. And so what would the Indians do? And of course, what the Indians would do, particularly in the south of India, is they would make dorsha. And so what we're going to do in this video is uh, show everybody how you can make dorsha. Uh, and the dorsha that I aim for are uh, very sour, very fermented dorsha, although uh, you can uh, stop them at any point along if you don't like them getting that sour. So uh, dorsha, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, if somebody has a better pronunciation I'd love to hear, uh, but dorsha are a kind of crepe, and so you use it um, as a base to put, uh, uh, obviously in the case of India, uh, curries on, but you can put anything you like onto, the, onto this kind of uh, crepe. So uh, I'll take you through how to make dorsha. Uh, it's a process that if you leave it, as if you ferment it as much as I do, it takes several days. Uh, but the great thing is uh, almost none of that time is hands-on and there's no particular timing so it'll fit with just about any schedule. Uh, dorsha are great because they're vegan and they're gluten-free so pretty much anybody can eat them. Now if you're wondering why uh, people who do mushroom videos are now suddenly doing something to do with food, it's because the fermentation process that happens with dorsha uh, occurs with wild bacteria uh, that occur in the air and on the um, and on beans and rice, but also wild yeast that occur on those things. So, as a fungi, uh, I love uh, fungi of any sorts, mushrooms, and the yeast that make up dorsha. So, if you come with me, uh, we'll look at how to make these. All right. So, what dorsha is is a mixture of beans and rice. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is show you uh, how to mix them up. Uh, and the first thing to note is that you can use any kind of beans and any kind of rice. As far as I can tell, it doesn't make any difference. If you look on the internet, uh, you'll find all sorts of people will say, you know, you can't use this bean, or if you use this bean, you can only leave it a couple of hours. As far as I can tell, none of that's true. Uh, all the beans that I've ever used uh, and rice have behaved in a very similar way. So what I'm going to use is um, some cannellini beans uh, that I have left over here and um, we're going, I'm going to mix those in a one-to-one -one ratio with the rice and for the rice I'm going to use some black rice uh, you, again you can use any kind of rice uh, people would usually use white rice or brown rice and if you use white rice you can use short grain or long grain basmati doesn't really matter uh, with, these, with this black rice it produces beautiful deep purple dorsha, whereas normally the dorsha are kind of beigey, crepey colour. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, soak the beans in the rice, so you need to soak them to soften them uh, for blending them later on, uh, and you should soak them for a few hours, um, I usually just soak them overnight, which is what I'll do. Uh, and so here's the cannellini beans, so we'll add that to the water. If you're not used to soaking beans, make sure you put plenty of water because they absorb quite a lot. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, soak the rice. And I'm doing these separately, obviously. And so what you'll notice is that I'm just doing a one-to-one -one mix of each. So most of the dorsha recipes you'll see will be uh, three to four um, volumes of rice to one volume of beans, or even up to six-fold. Uh, why do I do one-to-one? -one? Uh, one is I like beans. And the second reason is that um, I'm trying to balance the nutrition a bit more, so try and get uh, more protein uh, into my dorsha. And it works perfectly fine no matter which ratios you use. I don't know, so the dorsha that I make don't turn out uh, super crispy, so maybe if you use uh, a greater amount of rice compared to beans, you'll get uh, crispier dorsha. Uh, that sounds like an experiment to do. Uh, but I like, I like the one-to-one. -one. Uh, I should say that um, if you do different ratios, the process after this may not turn out exactly as I show, but it should be approximately the same. The other thing is uh, fenugreek seeds. Uh, so apparently fenugreek seeds make your dorsha a bit more crispy. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. Once again, that would be a good experiment to do. Uh, and 
I usually add in the order of a teaspoon and as you can see I don't measure it out uh, I just put them in and uh, in, a, in a rough amount so they can uh, soak with the beans and we can soak the rice and we'll leave that overnight and okay so um, overnight uh, we've soaked the beans and you'll be able to see that they'll greatly increase in size and if you feel them uh, they're a bit softer and you'll also see that the rice is um, released a lot of red liquid but they're still pretty dark uh, they're a little bit softer but not such a dramatic difference uh, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to drain them and then we're going to blend them and to blend them we're going to use a blender uh, you can use a blender you can use a food processor it doesn't really matter the more finely you blend it the more finely textured it will be but it's not a it's not a huge problem if they're, if they're a little bit gritty uh, and one of the advantages, of course, of using uh, the red rice is you get the nice red liquid produced. So uh, you can offer unsuspecting house drinks uh, a, a sample of your quality Penrose uh, Penfolds grain hermitage. Okay, so let's uh, drain these. Give them a bit of a rinse. So I'm no expert in blending, but um, I, the way I do it is mix it so it's approximately equal volume of uh, rice or beans and water, something like that, and, and we can set them going. When that's done, nicely blend it up, transfer into a large container. And then we'll repeat the process with the beans. Alright, once that's nicely blended, then add it in uh, with the rice and we'll try and get every last little bit. Okay, now at this stage uh, you can add the salt and I usually add uh, black salt, uh, which has a great fragrance, although not everybody agrees with that. The curious thing about black salt is it's actually pink uh, and I just add a bit. So I don't know if black salt makes any noticeable difference to the flavour compared to normal salt uh, and what the various amounts you have. So I like a bit of diversity so I just put in a rough amount. Uh, you can easily use white salt and I guess an experiment will tell if there's any difference. That can then be thoroughly mixed. And hopefully you can already see the gorgeous purple colour that we're going to get from this Dorsha next to the black rice. Okay, that looks great. Good thing about this is you don't have to worry about being sterile because you're going to ferment it anyway. And then what I like to do is get it so it's at a consistency where it just pours nicely with a label so that's maybe slightly too thick so we'll just add a little bit more water. So it's kind of like a thick batter I guess. It's the consistency you're looking for. A little bit more. Not too bad, so uh, we'll leave it at that. Now, this can be used at any time, so you can cook it even now straight away if you don't want to ferment it at all. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to let it ferment, and so bacteria and uh, yeast that are present, probably mostly on the rice and the beans, uh, will start to grow. Uh, and they will ferment that mixture, and so that's going to give the dorsha its characteristic uh, delicious sourness. Uh, and so that process will, will take several days, uh, but the good thing is you don't have to do very much. Uh, just stir it, uh, I stir it um, in the evening and in the morning, 
Uh, it depends on the temperature, so if it's, if it's warmer it'll take less time and you might have to stir a bit more often. Um, but for kind of roughly 20 degree Celsius temperatures, uh, this will work fine. So the last thing to do now is to get a damp tea towel and uh, then to uh, cover that and then leave it in a reasonably uh, warm place. So I leave it on top of the fridge for example. And then we'll come back and um, I'll show you, uh, I'll give you updates on how uh, the fermentation goes over the next few days uh, and until the point that we know that it's done. Now we're at the next day uh, and we're going to give this a stir and see what condition it's in. So uh, what you might find is that um, it's uh, got a lot thicker, so it's a lot thicker than it was yesterday. Um, this happens, maybe the beans and rice are absorbing more water. Uh, and so, um, but it looks essentially the same, but we'll just add some more water in to make it a bit thinner. And so that all looks fine. Um, hasn't really, the fermentation hasn't really taken off yet. We'll give that a thorough stir. It still smells quite beany. And then we'll leave that uh, to continue uh, to ferment covered again. So we're in the evening now and um, you might be able to see that there's some bubbles starting to form. So obviously this is starting to ferment well. Uh, if we scoop uh, the scoop, it's got a little bit of a crust on the top. So there's a little bit of separation of the kind of foamy stuff on the top and the more liquid stuff underneath. And uh, it's a bit darker on the top. So we'll just stir that in, mix that nicely. And so that's fermenting nicely. Um, You'll find that as it does this, it gets a bit more of a funky smell. That's totally fine. That discoloration is totally fine. Uh, keep it the face. It's all going, it's all fermenting nicely. Okay, so here we are next morning and it's still um, quite foamy, a little bit darker on the surface. So again, uh, we can mix in. You might find that it separates quite a lot more than this has. Depends on the uh, beans, I think, or perhaps the rice. So give that a stir. Uh, it's got a lot noticeably more funky smell now, uh, but again, that's all good. All right, so uh, now there's been a big change, and so what I don't know if how well you can see it, but rather than being foamy material on the top, now the liquid has come to the to the top, and the and the and the beany kind of batter's sunk down a bit, so it's more liquid on the top, and it's much denser down at the bottom. So uh, I'm. You can't you can't see but I, but it's but it's much thicker uh, and so when it's at that stage then it's kind of basically done I will ferment it for another day at room another 24 hours at room temperature um, just to get it really um, fermented um, but um, but now it will uh, it'll taste quite fermented if you cook it at this current uh, state uh, you can cook it at any point along the way uh, but if you want it the really fully fermented sour flavor then um, then leave it another 24 hours after it gets to that point of the liquid coming to the top uh, and then it'll be good. Alright, so now we're ready to make the dorsha so it's nicely fermented and so you can cook it any kind of way uh, on, a, on a hot pan. Um, I find that it's actually easiest to cook on the barbecue which is what we're doing here. So I heat up the barbecue so that the temperature gauge is at about 400 Fahrenheit or 200 Celsius roughly uh, and then we get going. And so um, I'll open that up and just put a little bit of oil, so we just want a very thin covering of oil uh, on the surface. And the dorsha settles out, so make sure it's thoroughly mixed before you uh, put it in. And each time you put a batch on, just mix it again to make sure it's thoroughly mixed. And then just put a bit on. You can make them any thickness or size you want. I quite like making quite small, relatively thin ones because they cook quite nicely. But the traditional dorsha are much are much larger in size, so you can also make them um, plate size if you like. Uh, and so we'll cook them on that side for say three or four minutes, and then uh, flip them over. So you can see they've bubbled up very nicely like this, and then just flip them over, and they're looking magnificent. 
what you'll find is that um, particularly if you make them a bit thicker or sometimes if you cook them in a pan um, they uh, are very sticky and can be quite difficult to flip over so this half cooked dorsha mix is about the stickiest substance on earth uh, so that's an advantage of making them a bit thinner okay. and then we'll just do that for a couple of minute, more minutes uh, and then they'll be done Okay, so now they'll be done, uh, so they look beautiful, see they can probably set a little bit, there's a bit of a squidge in the middle, uh, so with dorsha if, uh, if you do happen to have lost your shit over sourdough uh, then what you can, another thing you can do is you can mix in um, your leftover sourdough starter with the dorsha and it um, makes the dorsha a little less porous and a bit more rubbery um, so it changes the texture of them a bit but it complements the uh, sourness of them uh, so that should be It's good mm. Delicious.